Saint Nicholas. We know him as Santa Claus, but there's a different angle on him that we want to explore today, and that is Saint Nicholas as a theological minority. That's right. During his time in the Arian crisis, he was in the minority. The Trinitarians, those who would become known as the Nicene Church Fathers, were the minority. Probably about 80% of the bishops during this time period were on the wrong side. They were fighting for the Arians. They were defending the wrong belief that Jesus is a creature. And we're going to talk about that and how that applies to our time as well. But there can be theological minorities, and being in the minority doesn't mean necessarily you're wrong. Maybe Vigano is the modern-day Nicholas. Here to talk about that is my co-host, Tim Gordon. How are you doing? Good, Good morning, Timothy. There's a lot of people debating our, our name, our duo name in the comments. I know. I know. Kind of, you know, the time, yeah. you know, I kind of like diamond and silk of the Catholic world. Yeah. <laughs> you, Are you, we the diamond yeah, and silk? You're, you're very I, partial to that one. <laughs> I remember you saying that, uh, you said that a few times. I think you like diamond and silk yeah. a lot. Or Frodo and Samwise, but I don't know who gets to be who on that one. As long as people stay away from the, the comic books, we're I, good. I kind of like Gandalf and Aragorn. Yeah, there. you got two of the priestly offices yeah, there. Yeah, that's pretty to good. Us. Yeah. So, I don't know. When yeah, there's, you, you, when there's Batman and Robin, and I'm definitely Batman on that one, everybody says, so. You're just dying to say <laughs> I that. I know it, I know it. Anyway, let's get into it. Before we do, everybody like and subscribe to this, and if you're on iTunes, please leave a leave a review for us. Oh, I forgot to mention I wore my sweater. I don't know if you can see it, Tim. This is my St. Nicholas deadlifting sweater. <laughs> Nice. St. Nick deadlifting. Yeah, Yeah, because you think uh, deadlifts are king, right? I just... If there's one ring to bind them all, it's the deadlift, for yeah. sure. So that's why I'm wearing my St. Nicholas deadlifting yeah. tacky sweater. I wish, I wish I could deadlift with my back, but I can't. So... Yep. So St. Nicholas... But, uh, oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, say St. Nicholas, he needs to, he needs to do the deadlift because he's, he does all that, you know, picking up all that hoisting of his, his Christmas sack. That's right. Uh, he's got to carry yeah. the big bag. So we're going to talk today about the yeah. history of St. Nicholas theology. At the end, Tim, I want to yeah. save some time and talk about, should you be a literalist and tell your kids uh, that there's no Santa and there's only St. Nicholas and not play the game, not get into the legend of the myth? Yeah, we've already had yeah. some LBs in the comments saying, "I don't uh, telling your kids about Santa is a lie. You're lying to your kids." So we're going to get into that. <laughs> They're everywhere. The LBs are everywhere. The LBs. If I'm you amazing. don't know what LBs are, go see our Tolkien episode, and you'll find out. It's easy to reference. Yeah. So we're going to get to everything on Nicholas's life, including the legend that he and one. One version slapped Arius. Another one punched him with a closed fist. Uh, great story. Another one is he grabbed his beard. Yes. So they, they get, they get, it's a continuum of like girliness, right? It's <laughs> the beard, you know, hair pulling. Slap. You, know, you, you slap and then, and then close handed punch. Yes. And obviously, uh, you know, in honor of Tyson Fury, who fought this pest. Yes. You know, recently. Should we, we, get, we, oh, we want to shout out punched. Tyson Fury. We want to interview you. Yeah. He's a Catholic. He's got That's some it. good Catholic things to say, actually. Yeah. Did you see? Yeah. He, he says a lot of good stuff, man. I like that guy. Yeah. yeah. Tyson Fury. What's up? You won the fight, baby. Yep. You took him down. I hope you're watching. I sort of doubt you are, but I, I don't want to. <laughs> right. I want to believe you are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just like vegan. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. he, so St. Nicholas lived in, just before and into the Constantinian era of Catholic Christianity. Um, he was born in the late 200s. We don't know the year. Tradition puts him at uh, 270 AD. And he died on December 6th, 343. So he lives almost 20 years after the Council of Nicaea. So he doesn't see the Council of Constantinople. He doesn't see the further dates uh, we know he's a historical figure because he has a tomb. And on our oldest lists of the bishops who attended the Council of Nicaea, Nicholas of Myra is on those lists. 
I think he's on the tenth line. I read somewhere. So Nicholas is a real guy. We're going to look at the story of his life, and the story of his life, like all hagiography, is mixed up with a lot of legends that we might think are funny. But I'm telling you, people in the early church in the medieval era, they put this into stained glass, icons, murals. They loved these stories. Nicholas was hugely popular. Yeah, I want to take a minute to point out that on Wikipedia, there's a significant bias if you use Wikipedia and you didn't know. Because, <laughs> it's getting no, deep. I mean, yeah, right. <laughs> no, it's important that people know this because when you go through, I mean, like, like everyone will admit, we use it a lot. And when it comes to St. Nicholas Legendarium, they make everything out like it's a disputed, you know, they, they, they right. practically dispute the historicity of the person of Nicholas. And, and it's, I mean, not actually, but, but they'd have you believing that, that maybe, you know, 90% he's a person. St. Nicholas is well accounted for. And the fact that he's so well accounted for on the first list of uh, those who attended uh, Nicaea it goes to say a lot. Uh, there's there's some sort of dispute because he's not there on like the second oldest list of the attendees of Nicaea. This is a stupid point. So there are yeah. these like two competing theories with which serve to explain why he wasn't at the second uh, head count. Um, and one of them significantly longer. One's two hundred people attendees. Three hundred. Uh, the other one is three hundred attendees. The point of the story is he he's really they're disputing almost everything about the historic St. Nicholas. And um, from the not not just hagiographies, but from the important Christian biographers, we really we really know that that Nicholas is a real guy. And we also we also know that he was there and doing important things like like. uh, Not 100 percent sure, but but God willing punching Arius in his face and pulling out his beard hair. So it's just important to, it's important to understand that he's a real guy, um, absolutely historical. And some of the stories we'll be sharing about the guy are slightly more disputed than others, but he is real. And, and one of the most safe bets about St. Nicholas is that he was there at the first ecumenical church council on the side of the good guys. Yes. Definitely a Trinitarian. We also have evidence that Constantine built a church in honor of St. Nicholas. So that's more evidence. Um, Also, there's a story of another saint named St. Nicholas of Zion. And in his story, his conversion story, he goes and visits the tomb, the relics of the original St. Nicholas. So this guy's namesake. So... You know, it's like scholars doubt the existence of Nicholas. Scholars doubt the existence of Christ. Scholars doubt the existence of Mary, so on and so forth. You know, unless it happened yesterday and there's TV footage of it, they don't accept it. It's a hermeneutic of suspicion against all things Christian and miraculous. As long as long as he's not an Islamic prophet, then right. you know, even even one mere mention, you know. A thousand years later, and they're like, "This is definitely real. Don't be a hater." If it's a, <laughs> if it's a Christian, I mean, this is this is real. I'm not. No. This is this is the bias that exists in popular media, in Christian iconography. Christian, you know, even if it's well established, unless it's apodictically certain, you know, the the scholars are gonna gonna make Christians sound like dupes for believing in it. Jewish is kind of in the middle. They they have this this yeah. funny relationship with with the Jews the 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 mainstream liberal left media and then Islamic you know there can be there's far far less um, evidence for the historic uh, Muhammad than there is even for uh, Saint Nicholas so yes. and have you ever noticed you the secular media and secular politicians will refer to him as the Prophet Muhammad yeah, they do yeah they do. Like you yeah. wouldn't because ex- Muslims want them to say that you wouldn't expect the seculars to say the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, right, right. No, but they, yet they, they give yeah. him the the title. So the Prophet Muhammad. That, yeah, there's even a, I can't remember. There's a cardinal archbishop in the in the Low Countries somewhere in Northern Europe who refers to Muhammad as the Prophet Muhammad. If you're a Christian, you can't believe he was a prophet. He's not a prophet. No, he's not. 
In fact, one of my kids is a funny story. They were in, in their class, they were going through world religions. And one of the questions was, um, Muhammad received a vision from what angel? And my 10 year old son said, well, the right answer is Gabriel, but we know that Gabriel didn't really appear to Muhammad. I was like, good job, son. I was like, you can leave good. that out. You leave that out and miss it if you want. I'll be proud of good you. Good boy. Yeah. 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 Or just be like option C, no angel at all. Yeah. Or not a- Lucifer. Or Lucifer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was, that's the most realistic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, um, we know that Nicholas was in uh, Myra, that's Asia Minor. The story goes he was a young priest, and he made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And when he returned, uh, well, while he was gone, his uncle, who was the bishop, had died. And so the clergy there said, whatever priest enters the church first, we're going to make him bishop. This is the time period, by the way, when you didn't want to be a bishop. Right. Priests w- and monks would run away from the cathedrals to avoid becoming a bishop. Two reasons. Right. One, before Constantine, it meant you were going to be martyred. Pretty much all right. bishops were getting killed. Secondly, as we get closer to Constantine, it meant you were going to go to hell because bishops were seen as compromised later on. Now, this is pre, so it's more likely that you're going to be martyred. And we see that actually kind of does happen to Nicholas. And so Nicholas comes home from the pilgrimage. I'm going to go make a visit to the church. He doesn't know the game plan that the first guy, it's kind of like tag, first guy that goes into the cathedral is, or church, whatever, wherever they're meeting, is going to be consecrated bishop. He goes in, they say, oh, it's the will of God, Nicholas, you're going to be the bishop. Right. This isn't just pre-Constantine that we're talking. We're, we're talking uh, the worst of the Christian martyrs, uh, Diocletian. This is the end yeah. of the Diocletian rule. And Diocletian, specifically, I think in the 290s, well, you know, when you study church history, it's there's a sharp uptick in the both the rigor and the frequency of Christian martyrdom under Diocletian. Um, so this is particularly daunting. Yes. Uh, time to be a, a Catholic bishop. The story is I'd like to spend a little time on that. In 299, Diocletian uh, has divining done, you know, where they cut open the animals and look at the livers. And at this point, the diviner says to Diocletian, I don't, I can't get any messages from the gods. The gods are silent. And the reason is, is there's people here in court who are making the sign of the cross and it's undoing the divination. I can't do it. Can't do my magic. And back and before Constantine, the way Catholics made the sign of the cross was this. It wasn't the full oh, whammy. Right. Yeah. Like if you read, like, I think it's Tertullian and others, when they describe the sign of the cross, it's the cross that you received in baptism. So it's on the forehead, which goes back to the book of Revelation, the sign of the forehead. And so there's people in the, and also it's not obvious. Like if you're going to get killed, you don't like, you yeah. do the, you kind of do the subtle, subtle yeah. one. And so that was the thing that sort of rocked the Christians under Diocletian. And he said, well, we got to root these impious fools out who are making the sign right. of the cross and ruining our divination. Cause I'm the emperor. I need divination to know what to do. Right. And so that's the, that's the thing. And another shameless plug sword and serpent opening lines are the goddess silent. It's that scene in two ninety nine with Diocletian with the oh, nice. divination failing with crypto Catholics in the audience making sign of the crosses and basically blowing up the, the pagan rights of the emperor. So that's right. how it all gets kicked off. Now, Nicholas himself gets captured and placed in prison and is tortured. And this is why he was seen as a kind of a quasi martyr. What's interesting, as I read, I never knew this until yesterday, is that they took up the relics of Nicholas and studied them. They actually go back to the right, right time period. Um, it's a male, right age, but he had a broken nose. Yeah, And it showed that the broken nose had been healed, so it wasn't broken after the guy was dead. So this shows that someone did break his nose. I don't think it was Arius, because I think he won that fight. But this might refer back to him being imprisoned and being tortured under Diocletian. He didn't deny the faith. He did not deny Christ. 
Right. Or maybe he was just like a boxer, and this was <laughs> and what, what happened at, at at the Council of Nicaea was common. He went right. around fight fighting guys. That's, yeah, that's how I like. He's to a think brawler. About. Yeah, he's a brawler. He's a brawling. I didn't know a broken nose would show up like on on X ray. Did they have an X ray like after? Because the cartilage. I've had my nose broken too many times. Yeah. And um, how'd you break your yeah. nose? Fighting. Fighting. Yeah. 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 At least two times, maybe three. Right. We did they have to? Did they have to time. reset it? No, no. It just, uh, yeah, because they don't. There's not much they do for. It. Right. Very sensitive, anyway. But yeah, I don't. I mean, it's cartilaginous, you know. So yes. I don't know what. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I I like that. I like. Yeah. I like my saints to have had, you know. Uh, yeah, a broken nose. Broken nose. Yeah. But I, I do like the fact that, that it wasn't Arius that gave it to him. If yes, Arius breaks no. your nose, then you're, you, no. I think that removes your sainthood. No, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, so, um, so then we have him as honored at, the, the tradition is honored at Nicaea. Because remember, as you get to 325, 313, Constantine makes Christianity legal. It stated that that's when Nicholas was released from prison. So it was actually Constantine's decree. That free because probably another few days, weeks, years, he would have been killed. Nicholas yeah. would have been. So he was saved in the nick of time by Constantine. No pun intended. Yeah, exactly. Nick of time. In nick the Saint of time. Nick of time. Yeah. In the Saint Nick yeah. of time. And he's brought to the Council of Nicaea as really a living martyr, right? Not a red martyr, but a white martyr. And, you know, there he is with Arius. And that gets us to the legend the myth of the, the, the fight. Now, yeah. the earlier edition of this story of him fighting Arius on the floor of the council um, was originally that he struck an Arian. Right. Not Arius. Now, we know Arius was present at the council. And then the next version of the story is that he struck Arius. And I'm going to put a picture up on the screen of an of an icon, an Eastern icon. And there you can see Nicholas. He's got the clothes of a bishop on. And he's got a halo. And here he's giving him the H slap, that is the heretic slap. And H -slap. Arius yeah. has a black hat on and no halo because he's unholy. And this is in a lot of icons. Uh, this is enshrined deeply in the East. Right. Yeah, they're proud of it. Like in the West, this goes back to a church West, church East difference, right? Then I like every, every, almost every image you find of St. Nicholas in the uh, Byzantium. Mm -hmm. They're proud of this. Whereas I feel like in the Western church, we're always trying to let it be watered down. And we let him talk about it like he's not a, like he's not an enforcer. Whereas this should be like, this should be the main thing about St. Nicholas, even if, even if he did more important things, which he did lots that was important. Right. I like the idea of him being like the bash brother at the council of Nicaea. And yeah, he's like, the, more. He, he's the boondock saint. He is. He is. Yeah. He's a, he's a fighter from way back. So how long, how long is it that he had been imprisoned again? We don't know. Just that he was imprisoned. He's freed under Constantine. So he owes Constantine his freedom and he appears, what is it? Uh, 12 years later at the council of Nicaea. Uh, the story is Arius is invited to come onto the council floor and give his defense of his theology. Arius gets up. He says, now look, there can't be two gods. That's blasphemous. We're monotheists here. Let's be sensible. And therefore, Christ is a creature. There was a time when Jesus Christ was not. God the Father is the eternal divine substance, and he created his logos, and through that created logos, he made the rest of the created world. Nicholas right. just can't take it anymore. He stands up, <laughs> runs over there, slaps him, punches him, and grabs his beard, punches him in the face, and says, you LB. Right, right, exactly. LB, right? And says you're the wrong. Term. The apostles I mean, <laughs> taught us that there is the Father. We are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We aren't baptized into one God and two created persons. 
we are baptized into God, who is three divine persons. Yeah, imagine this is a little. It should make anyone mad. The concept of anti-Trinitarianism, any form of Arianism, or any form of um, Unitarianism, or whatever. Obviously, I, I love the fact that he did this, but it's a little hard to conceive of this graphic like playing out in real time because think about it you already you already know what arianism is and you're going there to combat it so that people won't won't be arians so that the heresy won't carry on that's that's why you call a church council in church history but it's it's a little funny when it, well, I was just thinking about this when you said it it's a little funny to conceive of like okay this is arius like this is his whole thing it's like jerry seinfeld says about plato and the platonic relationship like like plato named the relationship after himself everything now in the church is like oh that's that's arianistic that's quasi arianistic um he's arius and so even by the time that they got to nicaea and started having this council everyone associated arius with the heresy he was the the figurehead so it's kind of like, I wonder what made St. Nicholas so mad at the, at the council, you know, that he was like, I'm, well, you, I can't Nicholas, stand no more. Nicholas may have been surprised because remember, we don't, they didn't have Twitter and they didn't have the internet and they didn't have email. So he's an Asia minor and maybe he sees a bishop like what every, they weren't traveling around airplanes like they are now going all over the place, flying to Rome all the time. You know, maybe he saw another bishop once a quarter. And he yeah. said, hey, there's this stink. Did you get that epistle that was sent out by the emperor? Yeah, I did. What's going on? Well, there's this guy down in Egypt. He's a priest named Arius and his archbishop. Um, well, who was it? Uh, was it Alexander? Blanking yeah. on that. Uh, was it Alexander of Alexander? Yeah, I think it was. Can't that remember, sounds can't right. Quite remember. Yeah. yeah. His archbishop has uh, censured him, excommunicated him. He did what he should have done. But now Arius is going around all these other dioceses and preaching what his version of who Christ is. He's like, well, what's he saying? You know, it's like, well, he's saying that he's a little bit lesser than the father. And you haven't really heard what Arius has to say. It's true. You haven't haven't read the tweet. You know, you haven't, you know, gone and listened to his Arius' podcast. It's true. So the first time... And maybe Nicholas is being charitable. He's like, well, let's hear him out. Maybe he's not so bad after all. But the first time <laughs> Nicholas sees it, he's like, that literal, that bastard. And he just goes and punches him. Hold me back, bro. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. But, you think that was that? You think there's like a bunch of business like kind of holding him back? And then yeah, he broke exactly. through? And yeah, just, exactly. Usually when people want to be held back, though, they don't really, they're not going to do anything. Like, yeah. they're not going to do anything. But, but he, he got down to business, evidently. Yeah. I mean, re- remember, though. Um, just on the countervailing side, that this was published in like a book of like popular songs, which is a, like a weird concept. The like Arianism was it was published in a no Arian a book. No Arian was a musician. Yeah, yeah, he oh, was. He okay. was, no, he was taking popular poems and rhymes and songs. He was the and listen to this people. Arius was the first contemporary worship dude. He was taking right. conte- no. I'm serious. We got it. <laughs> he was extremely popular with the masses. Uh, yeah. and, and popular with the women, he would take popular songs and he would rewrite the lyrics in heretical way. I'm not talking about he would take hymns from the church. He would take popular songs, like bar right. songs. Right. And then he would put lyrics to them about God, but it would be the Aryan God. Right. Like, right. you know, like we just love Jesus. He's created, and, you know, these yeah. cheesy <laughs> contempt. He yeah. basically was taking contemporary music and trying to use it liturgically to poison the people. And it was, um, right. you know, this was a problem because he was using, I guess what you could call fourth century social media to spread his errors. Yeah. That's sneaky. Mary, Mary had a little what? Yeah. It says, it says whale here. Yeah, yeah, right, that's an right. Arius. That's an Arius him. He, right. just, he just likes to change stuff. Yeah. He belonged at that. Really, he belonged at the Second Vatican Council. He just had the impulse to tweak stuff. Well, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because we've, you know, Archbishop Vigano, who I see as a modern Nicholas, though no punches have been exchanged yet. Yet. But, but Vigano coined one of our favorite phrases, and that is weaponized ambiguity. And that was one of the things we saw in the Arian debate is once they got 
nailed with the Nicene Creed and homoousia, one same substance, father and the son of the same substance. Then they retreated to weaponized ambiguity. They said, well, let's just say we agree on the Bible. Right. Let's not use a word that's not in the Bible like homoousia. Like, I basically believe everything you do. I just don't agree with homoousia because it's not in the Bible. And they wanted to use the philosophical ambiguity to hide their position. Once they were caught after 325, they used weaponized ambiguity. And so then you see it goes from Arian to what they call semi-Arian, with Eusebius of Nicomedia. And he's just hiding behind ambiguity for decades. Well, this is, so, it, yeah, it's not, um, this is a rhetorical ploy, and yes. it, it, go, it basically goes to make a couple of the logical fallacies. When you say, I mean, it's basically saying, look, let's focus on what the, that which we already agree. Let's not focus on that which we disagree. Usually, if, if you hear someone saying that, I don't know, Peter Kraft in the, in the Kraft-Spencer debate on Islam, if you've ever seen that, he's like, let's just... Let's focus on what we agree about. He kept wanting to, in that debate, talk about the Enlightenment, not Islam. It's like, everyone agrees about that, dude. The Enlightenment's bad, but we want to talk about whether Islam's bad or not. And we know what you think, but you just, you know, for the sake of, you know, not looking silly for an hour and a half dialogue, you want to focus on something that that makes you sound good, or it's easy to sound good. That's that's an old rhetorical ploy. And that is what semi-Arianism is, is just... It's kind of dumb that we even allow the distinction. We really shouldn't. It yeah. is Arianism. These, this is what the Arians used. It was just them say, backpedaling a half step, saying, um, we're not going to insist on our terms. Right. You know? like, yeah, so it's, it's, and, it's, and they a, just it's like a weird the, position. They like the ambiguity. It's like people saying, well, I'm not against Latin, the liturgy. Sacrosanctum Concilium in Vatican II says Latin should be retained. So once a year, we do the Agnus Dei in Latin at our parish. Right, right. Like, okay, well, yeah, you're kind of conforming to what the council said, but you're really right. not. You're really not. Right, right. If it's the language of the liturgy, which it is, yeah. then um, just do, do, do your liturgies yeah. it's in It's like, well, in during Holy language. Week, we do the Agnus Dei in Latin. Like, okay, well, it's not really retaining the language, but... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's another cool story about this punch out. Remember Mike Tyson's yeah. punch out? That was a that was a game, I, man. I was playing it last time I was with my brother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah Mike we, Tyson's we, punch out. Yeah. We play it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh Tyson Fury's named after Mike Tyson. He is. It's crazy. And it's it's fitting. This is a total aside, but the thing is, anyone who played Mike Tyson's punch out, there's a version that came out two years before in '84 called punch out where they had, they pulled Mike Tyson out at the last minute. And the, the guy you fought at the end was Mr. Dream. Sorry. This is just, this yeah. is important, but in the 86 Mike Tyson version. Yeah. In the, in the, in the Tyson version, remember the first 90 seconds of the match, if he hits you once you're with, out. with that uppercut, you're out. Yeah, and so this I'm was old enough lot. where I played the Mike Tyson punch out as a kid. Yeah. yeah no, no, me too. Me too. I, I didn't play punch out much except in arcades, mm. but, um, yeah, so in, in the Mike Tyson's version, that you have 90 seconds, you got to survive all punches, and then you make an he's still a very tough opponent. But we were saying this is a lot like, this is my brother's point, this was a lot like the Tyson Fury fight, where he basically had to avoid any right hand by Deontay Wilder, because it was kind of like Mike Tyson's punch. And he did it for 12 rounds, almost, you know, 11 and a half rounds, and he caught that big, that big right that was bad. But yeah. And he's, he's named after the fighter in the game. So Mike Tyson. Um, I, I don't think Arius had anything to worry about from even, even the holy hand, holy he- right heavy hand of St. Nick. I don't think he could throw like that. But um, I like to imagine that, that he had a big right. Yeah. And any right. Well, in the icon, he's, he's going in with the right. He's kind of got the left hand with the beard and the right hand with the, with the strength. Yeah. Like one of those guide jabs, again, yeah. Deontay Wilder throws those. You kind of steady the head and, and then uh, and go around. with the big right. Yep. Yeah, I think, but, but if a guy has a long beard, you just hold it, hold the <laughs> head right. steady and, and right. knock, knock him out. That's right. <laughs> especially if he's a heretic. Exactly, yeah. Especially, so, yeah. Well, the, I, I want to talk about the this H at slap. the end. 
So there's one the there, there's one detail that's in almost all St. Nicholas icons that I think everybody watching who's seen a St. Nicholas icon, I'll put one up on the screen now. So this is the St. Nicholas icon that everybody has seen. We have one similar to this in our home. And above St. Nicholas on our right, his left, is, and sometimes they're switched, but on one side is the Blessed Virgin Mary, and she's holding up a pallium, which is the sign of a bishop. On the other side is our Lord Jesus Christ, and he's holding up a book of the Gospels. Why is this happening? Well, in the legend, Constantine and the bishops can't believe that a bishop would stand up and strike a priest, Arius. Mm -hmm. So they put mm -hmm. him in timeout. They put him in jail, right, for, for causing chaos on the council floor. While he's in prison, Jesus and Mary appear mm -hmm. to him. And he says, look, I just did this because I love y'all. You know, mm -hmm. Mary, you're the Theotokos. You gave birth to God, the God-man. Christ, you are the eternal God. You are the Logos. And they approve of him, and they give him back, supernaturally, his pallium. Mary gives him the pallium, and Jesus gives him the book of the Gospels, which is a sign of being a bishop, that you have a copy of the scriptures. So in a sense, they reinstate him. They reconsecrate him in a way, like in a divine, supernatural way, as a bishop. And that's I think that's one, the ultimate reordination. To exactly. Be, yeah. I mean, you don't get reordained. The character's eternal. But as far as I know, besides the 12 apostles, there's no other bishop who, and Paul, who got a direct commissioning from the Son of God himself. So in almost every single icon of Nicholas, in those top corners, you're going to see Jesus and Mary presenting these things to Nicholas, and that's a reference to him being in jail under Constantine. And he gets free. And they, yeah. yeah, they set him free, too. They, he gets they free, and they're like, hey, how'd out. you get free? And how'd you get your What's book up? back? And your pal name, he's yeah. like, uh, Jesus and Mary hooked me up and gave me my stuff back because y'all took it away. Right. You know? Yeah. Now, now what's what with Arius? And they're like, yeah, he's a bad dude. He's like, I told you. That's why I punched him in the face. But how'd you get out of the cell? He's like, oh, I don't know. Some, some, I can't remember who it was. Oh, yeah. Jesus and Mary yes. let me out. Let me Become out. Become whoop, whoop your, whoop your A, yeah, buddy. Exactly. And so all the, almost all the Eastern Nicholas icons have this story that we're talking about embedded in the icon. I mean, I have Arius like TKO on the ground, but mm -hmm. they do have Jesus and Mary giving him the symbols of Episcopate, which shows that Jesus and Mary see him of all the bishops at the council. They see Nicholas as the true Episcopus, the true bishop. Because that's what a true bishop does, is he goes, goes to blows if he needs, needs to do it. Yeah, and the story, I'm always surprised. I think our Lord likes that. that. I mean, think about Peter cuts off the ear. You know, they're like trying to jump our Lord in the garden. And Peter pulls a sword. Now, Peter's wearing a sword because Jesus told him to. Jesus says, go right. and sell and buy swords. And Peter says, we have two. And Jesus says, that's enough. Like, Christ is saying it's okay to be armed. Now, I didn't know. I didn't know Christ sent him to get swords. No, he said. When was he that? said, "Go and sell and get swords." And Peter says, "We have two. And Jesus says, "That's enough." I didn't know it's that. At the Last Supper, yeah, I can't remember which gospel, but it's in there. In fact, this is what That's Boniface the Eighth used that verse. He used that to claim that he had spiritual and temporal authority because Peter says, "We have two. and so he said those signify allegorically the temporal sphere and the ecclesiastical. Uh, yeah, that's right. Because that's Peter right. says we have two swords. And so he said that there's a reason for that. But anyway, he hit, literally had two swords. And when they're jumping our Lord, he pulls a sword and cuts the ear off a guy. I mean, Peter was kind of gangster. I mean, our Lord's like, hey, put it away. And he heals the ear. But there's something in our Lord that likes kind of some, some rowdiness. Like, I think it shows that you have a pulse. You're alive. You care. Right. Right. Contrary to the... Uh... MacArthurians out there who are have, have popularized this point of view that that you know Christianity is just glorified pacifism. Right. Who would like that? That's not even attractive to well, me. Even but, Nietzsche, uh, even Nietzsche criticized Christianity as being just passive and weak and effeminate. And you know, at somewhere Nietzsche even says, you know, I can't remember the exact words, but he he criticizes Christians for having a God who can't dance. Yeah. Dance. Right. 
Uh, it's in uh, uh, da, 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 da. yeah, his book of aphorisms is where he says, "I would only follow a god who could dance." Is it "Thus spoke Zarathustra"? I can't remember. Uh, I think there's reference to it in "Thus spoke Zarathustra." Where anyway, he can't believe in a god that doesn't dance. But in the in the story of the prodigal son, the dad throws a party. Twilight of the Idols. That's what's it. Okay. That's what it's in. Okay. Yeah, and he also says that. He says in the Antichrist that that even though he liked Jesus, he thought Jesus was the best man on earth. He said he couldn't have been a god because he was incapable of saying no. Which again, it sounds like Nietzsche was was operating on the basis of sort of the the postmodern Jesus that's non scriptural because Jesus yes. was telling everyone well, no all the time. So Nietzsche is kind of coming out of the Pietistic Lutheran. Tradition, right. which is kind of like the Methodist version of Lutheranism, where dogra, dogma and doctrine and all that kind of stuff is pushed aside, and it's more right. of the "how do you feel about spirituality?" Right. It's more. It's all effective. Right. So, so Nietzsche is coming out of that, and he's rejecting it, which is kind of a good thing. I reject that as well. But he didn't have another version of Christianity presented to him. Right. His dad was a his dad was a minister. I, I think uh, his dad was like a pietistic Lutheran minister. Yeah, he was. Was he, was he a minister or just a Lutheran? He's a Luth I mean, no, he was his dad was a minister okay. for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he didn't like so he's, it. So he's drinking Fritz. out of that font and maybe that font was slightly poisoned. Yeah. yeah. Well it's it's in like we we're saying, uh to get back to the your first point, it's seriously unattractive. To men, right? And when you when you when you pitch, uh, MacArthur was out there saying this uh, on Ben Shapiro this week. When you say that that Christianity is pacifistic, it shows an inherently flawed understanding of what Christianity yep. is. Um, because Jesus didn't want the apostles to fight the Romans, you know, in the way that the zealots wanted to do so. It doesn't mean that all fighting is bad. It just meant specifically the, the Roman Empire is not going to be overthrown, right? right. One of Thomas's four uh, prongs for a just war is that it must at least be plausible. It must at least be winnable. You can't just be um, killing, you know, the, the father, you know, uh, soldiers, centurions or whatever. Uh, who are the father of a family in many cases, just to like make a statement or like guerrilla warfare where you have yeah. no hope of overthrowing the empire, which they didn't. These these Jews in the corner of a tiny little corner, kind of the armpit of the Roman Empire, you had no real cl uh, chance of overthrowing the Roman Empire. So people out there don't fall for this lie. Jesus was not speaking generalistically when he said don't don't wage a revolution. He was just saying, look, there's no, no realistic chance for it here. But something like 1776, where there's a real shot to be even a large empire and to, to you know, secede, that, that there's much more fertile ground for conceiving of that as yeah. a just revolution. And we have, just, we have the example of the Maccabees. That was God-approved. Right. That was a God-approved revolt where... Israelite men went out and killed Seleucid Greek men, and it was and God delighted in it. He yes. wanted it to happen. He wanted his temple regained and blood was shed. Moses, you know, the Levites go and kill all the idolaters with the sword. And Moses says to them, Today you have anointed yourself, ordained yourself priest of God. Legit. And the Levites became the priests because they took up the sword against idolatry in their midst. So this whole idea that Christianity and is nonviolence, or that it was violent, and then in eighty thirty three it, it God flipped the switch, and it became nonviolent, isn't true. Up until the last five years, there has always been a just war theory. There has always been bloodshed for the sake of righteousness. Augustine and Aquinas say that just wars are actually part of the virtue of justice. Yeah. Well, you can't you can't have just as well defending it. Yeah, there's got to be an enforcement provision. We should do a show at some point. We always talk about what shows we should do in the middle of shows, and then right. we we don't do them. But oh. we need to do a show on the new natural law. I mean, that's I'm yeah. sure you've done a lot of stuff. Yeah. We need to take those guys on. Yeah, I'm, I'm sick of those guys. Take it down. 
you know, we need to need to get a Arius versus <clears throat> St. Nicholas moment. Yep. Punch some beards. So uh, let's just wrap up on the legend here. We want it to be true, so it has to be true, right? <laughs> this, this is basically what it is. Yeah, yeah. somebody, uh, a commenter yesterday was like, dude, please don't like ruin this for me. This is huge for me right now. As a Roman Catholic, I mean, he didn't say this, but this is kind of how I feel like the 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 nicholas beard grabbing and like h slapping h slap arius is it's one of the only really good things that we're clinging to right now aside <laughs> from of course the trinity and the eucharist and all that it's like there's not a lot of like hot stuff to to cling to in roman catholicism right now like don't take saint nicholas right. as a tough dude for me and i was like i i really relate to that i like yeah. i like that guy that said that like we're I not taking it. it from you yeah people challenge it and, and again, this goes back to what I said about Wikipedia wanting to challenge everything in 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 um, Christian legendarium, just unless it's like perfectly videotaped. They 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 challenge it on the basis that the first record is from fourteen hundred or something. Yeah, it's like that that doesn't matter. We have we also have uh, we also have the tradition capital T. Not that it's part of capital T tradition, but. But some stories only survive by word of mouth, and they're not ipso facto false because of it. A lot of stories, I should, I should reverse, many stories, um, particularly in the ancient times and the early Middle Ages, only survived by word of mouth. It's not that uncommon. Sure. So, yeah, so this is, it's, it's a highly plausible account. Yeah. And, and plus, why would they make this up a thousand years later? They're, all the rhetoric... Um, you know, to, for on behalf of the vocal minority, which we, we have to talk about here. You, you said you wanted to talk about the the demographics in terms of, OK, who's really in demographical charge, the Aryans or the Trinitarians? And it was really the the Aryans. Right. The Aryans. So, and Constantine, a, you know, I'm a fan of Constantine. There's a great book called Defending Constantine. But let's be frank. Constantine enabled and initially favored and even afterwards gave a lot of cover for the Aryans and the semi-Aryans. He did. Though he, he, he called, he, I mean, to his credit, he called the, he called, he called the, the council. council. He convened the council. The council made the right decision. He upheld that, but then he realized, Hey, I've now got political problems. And now I've multiplied that with ecclesiastical problems. I think Constantine just wanted those problems to go away. And to he realized by having the council and it having a definitive answer, it caused a lot of problems in the decades to come. And I think he probably maybe personally regretted that. But there's something there's a there's a great Constantine quote when he convened the council. It was like, um, you know, division in the church is worse than civil war. And what yeah. it, I mean, it's like this is from this is from a non-Christian emperor. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't baptized, baptized till his yeah. deathbed. Yeah, so it's like, man, could we have in in a day in an era of of staunchly dichotomously separated church and state, even half of the Christian politicians we have, you know, like Christian politicians, they don't talk this robustly. Right. Like division in the church okay. is worse than war. Can we get a non Christian like this? Well, let's play you know? this. Let's play this game. This will be fun. Okay, so we have Donald Trump. I think well, he's not Catholic. I think everyone, if whether you're a Donald Trump fan or not we all recognize that part of his worldview is flawed and none of us see him as historically a great moral man or a, a teacher of ethics. Right. Right. So let's just make this a modern day story. Uh, it's not a USCCB year and Trump's like, Hey, I want all bishops in DC fly in. We've got to deal with the McCarrick vegano situation. It's too crazy. Right. You right. all got to come in. And so they all come into D.C. Maybe they meet at the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, the Basilica in D.C., right? And they're all there. And then Vigano comes in and, you know, they start talking. And then Vigano just, like, runs out of nowhere and, like, tackles McCarrick, you know, and bites him or <laughs> punches. I don't know. I don't know what Vigano would, would lead with. What do you think? Lee, Vigano would bite, bite his ear. But like Tyson, but you only do that when you're when you're losing in boxing. Right. So he'd hit him then bite his ear. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what would that? Can you imagine? You know, and then yeah. and then eighty percent of the bishops would be on the wrong side, and twenty percent. You know, well, I guess that's kind of later on. 
at this time, the majority got the right vote, right? But yeah, can you imagine like how odd this whole thing is that Constantine, who's not even baptized, right, convenes a council, has all these bishops come in. I don't. I, I'm guessing Constantine paid their way and put them up in, right. the, in the Hilton. Right, fifty because it's like fifty mile. Constantine called this council, and sorry, I'm not trying to disrupt your uh, your historical likeness analogy, but my fantasy. So, my, <laughs> your, your, so my so vegano Nicaea is like yeah, your vegano fantasy. Like yeah. this, this could really help. Uh, no, I'm not saying it couldn't. Um, right. It, it's so Nicaea is like fifty miles southeast of of Constantinople. Right. So he calls the council. Well, Constantinople doesn't exist yet, technically. Well, He's technically yeah, Nicomedia is kind of the base from the Bosphorus. He's over there. But he, he moved the capital city to Constantinople, I thought, in 317. Mm, did he? Okay, then. I they, think so. I think it was. Keep talking was, and I'll check it. Yeah, check it. I, I think it was right after it was right after the Edict of Milan. Okay. What's Edict of Milan? 314? 13, 313. I, 313. So yep. I thought it was three three years after. So three sixteen or three seventeen. I thought Constantinople became the capital. Whenever it is, I'll, I'll keep talking. Whenever whenever that is that he moved the capital. Um, what happened was it left a power vacuum because he he all but abandoned Rome, right? And just just so people have the, you know, historicity of what was happening in in the western part of the empire and. Constantinople was the new eastern part of the empire where he's shifting the power. You want, um, the data is he's, he's he founds Constantinople in 324. Oh wow. And uh, dedicates a city in 330. So it's it's over the Nicene Council period. Well, okay. It might be why so he didn't ac- actually have the council. I never thought of this like why didn't you have the council in Constantinople? Maybe he wasn't ready yet. So Maybe I, it wasn't. Let's ready. jump down to Nicaea. But wasn't it already an established port city? Yeah. Uh, it just wasn't called Constantinople. Yeah, yet. it was called it was, uh, Byzantium. That was the name Byzantium, of the city. That's yeah. right. That's right. And now we call it Istanbul. Istanbul. I know. I call yeah. it Constantinople. No, I call it Constantinople too. I would never call it Istanbul. But uh, if I can come into America, like his mama called him Cassius Clay, I'm going to call him Cassius Clay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Constantine called Constantinople. I'm going to call it Constantinople. Eddie Murphy. Yeah. But so, I mean, so it's like he, 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 he was living there. Right. At that yeah. point. Now, yeah. My whole point is he, he calls the council. It's the emperor, even though he's not Christian, the concept of convening a, a church council by an emperor who's not even a Christian. It is not even like Charlemagne no. who called himself second Constantine and was kind of trying to be like Pope's helper. Yeah. Uh, Constantine was was very pro Christian again more of a Trump figure than a Charlemagne figure yeah. and um, yeah he so he called it and and so Nicaea is in his backyard it's his barbecue so yeah. he he uh, he has it in his backyard and but the point is so Rome what was happening in Rome during this time immediately once he shifted the power dynamic eastward to the to the Greek Turkish part of the empire the eastern don't part say of the Turkish empire, dog don't say Turkish. We'll go. We'll go. Asia Minor. Helena. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Asia Minor. That's right. Um, yeah. So, so it left a power vacuum that the church filled in. The church was even administering state-like functions in yes. Rome, and that, that's an important thing because we, when when you study this period of church history through all the next three councils, you you know all the things that happened at Council of Constantinople, Ephesus, uh, Chalcedon. You're forgetting what's happening in Rome at this time, and already the infiltration of the barbarians is beginning. Visigoths, Vandals, they're flooding in to Rome. And again, what's happening, these were, these were non-Judaic Christians, the, the sort that was, were being discussed at like the Council of Jerusalem. You know, can we baptize non-Jews? Only Jews are really properly equipped and trained to understand the Trinity and monotheism because only, only they understand, you know, Yahweh. And you see this playing out 300 years later, because when you get the Visigoths and the Vandals and all of these basically, you know, pagans, Gentiles with the, something like the Greco-Roman polytheism, 
they filter into Roman. They don't understand monotheism enough to understand the Trinity. It's a difficult concept even for us. But so they're filtering into Rome and they automatically, it's like for some reason, heresy always has the, the upper hand in the popular mind over, over orthodoxy. And this is yet one more example. I mean, think about today that the heretics in the church that are trying to push all of the heresies with moral theology. They have the upper hand with, with uh, Johnny Sixpack, who doesn't really care much about orthodoxy, you know, as a, right. as a kind of second nature, because they're, they're, it's, they're, they're making the lowest common denominator type appeals. This is the same thing in a non-moral theological context with the Trinity. People are like, what? It's, it's three, God, three, three persons, so isn't that just a smaller version of polytheism, you know? Right. Um, or, yeah, yeah. God's, uh, Jesus is the son of God. And they're like, oh, like Heracles, like that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. cool. I get it. Yeah. Heracles, Zeus. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and Heracles is, is more human than human, but, but less God than I mean, God. Like, I get it. One thing going for the Greeks in Asia Minor and in Greece and Macedonia is they have the Platonic Aristotelian tradition. Right. They have Stoicism. They even have a bit of Neoplatonism. Like Plotinus says that the form of the good has three hypotheses. Like, you know, like that's, you're getting real close to Nicaea right there, right? That's right. That's right. So you already have amongst the intellectual Greeks a rejection of crude polytheism. Right. In an understanding of the one, the form of the good, and how the form of the good can be expressed, even though this is getting a little bit heretical in Trinitarian thought, we wouldn't say that. We wouldn't say that the three persons are expressions. But the, but the, the soil has been, been broken open for right. the Greeks and the Greek I didn't way know of Plotinus thinking. said that. I said, I said, well, I have a whole right, theory on that because there's a, usually so. Because Plotinus likely studied under a guy named Ammonius Saccus with origin. Now, secular scholars say there's two origins, the Christian origin and the pagan origin, because there's no way the, the Christian origin could have been hanging with Ammonius and Plotinus. But I think Plotinus is stealing from Christianity. Other people think it goes the other way, but that's a whole different show. Yeah, that's interesting. But that's all happening in the 200s, right. mainly in Egypt. And it's, it's interesting that that's all happening in Egypt. And then where does Arius come from? Alexandria, Egypt. So Alexandria, yeah. So it seems that, that Neoplatonism and all that, it's a different strand of Neoplatonism that Arius is taking that's wrong. It's actually the more pagan strand that he's amplifying and ultimately gets shot down. Plotinus is from uh, Alexandria, right? As a parting uh, shot. Uh, I think, I don't, I think <laughs> he's not natively from Egypt, but he definitely studied there. Yeah, because it's yeah, yeah the, the Greek part. The I want to say Plotinus is Syrian, but I might be mm. wrong on that. We'll have to look that up. I'm looking it up now. So, yeah. Keep talking. The reason this is important, so just so people know, is because in the patristic period, um, the most important pre Christian philosopher is Aristotle. There, uh, you know, more than, more than Plato, but Aristotle was lost for a thousand years. Uh, one thing you should, I'm not being politically correct here, I've, I've never done that, but uh, you should actually thank the Muslims for is preserving the Aristotelian texts. Um, they all popped up in Spain, uh, like Cordova and Segovia. So I want to disagree with that. We're, we're going to go. We're because gonna go. here's why. Here's go why. Ahead. All of the translators that were in the Muslim courts were Christian monks. It was the Christian monks oh, who really? could speak Arabic, Syrian, and Greek because of the liturgy. Got it. And when they came in, I didn't know you that. like look at where all these texts are coming from. They're coming from the court scholars. And it's true. The Muslims commissioned them. The Muslims preserved them. The Muslims distributed them. But the people who actually made the translations and were in charge of the text were actually these Christians. Some of them were Nestorian monks. Really? That, that were basically court scholars in the, the Muslim court. So, but then why were they all in Arabic, like in, in the thousands and 1100s? Why did they have to retranslate them into? Because they're lost by that point. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. in the 700s, 800s, 900s, you have Christians and Nestorian Christians 
who are taking them into Greek, from Greek into Syrian and into Arabic. Oh, I didn't know that. That's yeah. good to know. That yeah. way I don't have to say even half of one you don't have politically to correct you know, thing about Islam. I don't yeah, want to give there's all There's Islam a really anything. good book. Um, I'm trying to remember the title of it. Maybe if I remember, I'll put it in the show notes. And he actually documents who these, these monks were and how the, the, the Aristotelian texts were actually being right. preserved. And we actually know some of their names in the, that's, that's in the good Islamic to know. courts. I thought I thought I was just jokingly for half a second. Uh, I thought you were going to say Aristotle's not the most important pre pre Christian oh, no, no, Greek no, no, no. No, no. Yeah, yeah, because it was really so. What I was saying is Plotinus is is the is very important for Augustine, Saint Augustine, and and basically all the patristics. It was a, a movement called Neoplatonism, which is distinguishable from Platonism, Plato's actual philosophy and and followers. Um, Neoplatonism is probably half a step more conducive to Christianity than outright Platonism. But the Neoplatonists are the ones that, that, um, that the, the people that were teaching St. Augustine, they're the ones that pull Aristotle and Plato's philosophy closer together than they were in, in reality. Yes. Um, yeah, like you the, see, the Neoplatonists say that Aristotle did not break from Plato, that it was a sleight of hand. Right. And that's, that's just, that's, demonstrably false. I, mean, I don't know. Never... I kind of like it. Do you like it? Because it's, because it's Christian. See, I, but teach, it's... I teach Aristotle as a, as a Platonist, as a continuum on Plato, but I know like a lot of people, maybe yourself don't. But... Well, no, he is. He, he yeah. is insofar as they're both dualists, right? They're both dualists. See, and, and Aristotle and Plato gave the world that, and you, you would never take it away from him. Um, there's, there's a lot in even moral, moral philosophy where, right. where he, where Aristotle doesn't break from him. But aside from that, he's on the, he's on the platonic, uh, wave, but except aside from that, like Plato couldn't even solve the problem of the universals. He knew there's something wrong with it, right? but it's really Aristotle with, with prosthetic vivacity and that we'd call it analogy, solved the problem of the universals. Plato was a genius. He yes. knew there was something wrong, you know? See, I kind of think I kind of think of it as like Augustine and Aquinas. There would be no Aquinas without Augustine, but Aquinas is Aquinas fixes a lot of the problems that are in Augustine. But I would still say Aquinas right. is an Augustinian. Right. That's what I right. would say. Right, but Aquinas, Aquinas exactly, perfectly said Aquinas is an Augustinian. Look how much he quotes him. Yes. But he fixes a lot of the problems. Plate uh, Aristotle is is Platonic insofar as he's a dualist, but he fixes all they're not even problems. Plato just admitted he couldn't solve the problem of the universals. And right. ontologically, Aristotle solves that. Everyone's probably like with these with these two nerds, just uh <laughs> yeah, go find go find a heretic and fight him. We like that more. Yeah, but exactly. um <laughs> which I'd like to do. We should do right. we should do two on we should do two on two like tag team debate, but mm. then we should there should also be boxing gloves and we should, should box. Be. Yes. Like, I disagree there. If we can't solve this in debate, like just two on two tag team boxing. Yep. Well, that's, that's my, big, my type of debate. You know, my kids and my wife are always like, what do you want for Christmas? I'm like, I got everything. I'm a blessed man. I don't need anything. But the one thing I don't have that I'm asking for Christmas that I'm hoping to get, Joy, if you're watching or if you're listening, is a punching bag. I really want a punching bag. Heavy, heavy bag or speed heavy, bag? Heavy bag. Yeah. Heavy speed enough where I, can kick it, where I can kick it too. You know? Like All a, right. Like a hundred pounder, I'm thinking. You know, that's yeah. good? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Speed bags are fun too. Well, I'm working up to that. Yeah, they're fun though. They in a different way. Right. Are we gonna get back to Nicholas, man? Yeah, that's right. Well, he, <laughs> come on, boxing. Not even just analogies. Just outright talk of boxing is what you do when you talk about Santa Claus, right? Because he's a, a boxer. He took. Don't don't get in his way. Yeah, but it is interesting. I mean, we should do a show on on early early appropriation of Greek thought because origin following Ammonia Sakos teaches that Aristotle was a Platonist and that he was just kind of maneuvering, making there's a few places where Aristotle says he's breaking with Plato, but they're like, eh, he's kind of just rhetorically saying that. And that if you read origin, he believes that the Stoics, Plato and Aristotle are all saying the same thing. Yeah, They're just emphasizing it's, the difference. I know. That, I goes, know. that goes so against the Dominicans. St. Thomas would, would be rolling in his grave. I, I mean, 
he solved the problem. Plato wanted the unity of the virtues, which is yes. like he doesn't. Oh, Plato never understood categories because, in order for some, in order for a thing to be predicated of multiple categories at once, like for a cow oh, to yeah. be both belong to the category of bovine and like four legged creature and brown creature. It, it literally, it has to be predicable of those multiple categories all at once. Totally agree. And Plato himself admitted, he's like, I don't know how you can do this. I know you can, because I know a cow belongs to all these. I know a human belongs to both podcaster and, you know, <laughs> hominid and two-legged creature, but I don't know how at once. It's analogy, which ends up getting far better developed in Thomas than it gets in Aristotle, right. but Aristotle goes down that path. Right. But they and, just want to see, like, they just want to see, like, a continuum of, course. of philosophy. They don't want to see it as, like, broken. I'm just no, saying that's, that's how the Christians want to see it. And I think it's kind of cool that way. That's how I like it. Well, I like it that way, too. I don't, I don't think anyone challenges that. It's right. just the breakage between Aristotle and Plato was, was, it's was subs- big. It, it's but substantial. It was still, yeah. Yeah. It's more substantial than they said. But Aristotle is, ontologically speaking, Platonic, just insofar as he's a dualist, form and matter, boom, yeah. done, and he's steady with him. Yeah, that, that's that's the it. most important development ever in the history of philosophy comes from Plato. That's why people still these. Right. All the important sub distinctions are, are Aristotle, where he he makes them intelligible. But form and matter, boom, everyone everyone get out your uh, school of Athens. Yep. I'll There's ride a reason the train. Plato. And, I'll, yeah, I ride that train. Yeah. So. Okay, so we got a little bit of time here. We should talk about why you're, you should play Santa, the, the Santa myth with your kids, and how much fun that is. But before that, we, we got a few more miracles here of, of Nicholas, one of which is the dowry of the three virgins. So Nicholas notes that there's a, a poor man, he falls on bad times, he has no money. During this time period, if you didn't have money and you had a bunch of daughters, there was one vocation that all young girls could enter into and make coin and that was prostitution and this was a real danger i mean we don't fully understand this that prostitutes uh were what we call the sex trade now they were in many ways forced into it you know they didn't go to like college and get a degree and you know become a vice president of a nonprofit and make (laughs) make money you know like this did not happen if you did not get married off or join a convent. There wasn't much left to you. Prostitution happened. Yeah, uh, Steph and I were talking about this last night. This this part of the Nicholas Legendarium, and she was like, "What about just the option of staying at home and not working? Like, like why? It strikes the modern ear as odd that it's like, well, you got to do something. So, <laughs> so uh, you know what I mean? Right. It's like what." Yeah, I guess prostitution was the only option they had. If if Saint Nicholas didn't, well, I think part of that is is the fathers, the parents, did not live long and have. You know, it's like you would go and stay with your fifty year old father, your sixty year old father, your seventy, eighty year old father. You know, people were dying off late forties, forty five. Yeah, yeah, so for sure that's true. So your dad dies, and the bank comes and takes away the house because of the mortgage, and then. You're on the street. Yeah, yeah, you're on the street. So Nicholas sees this. He's a Christian man. He's obviously against prostitution, as all Christians are. And so he sneaks into the house and leaves some money. And this person, yeah. enough money for a dowry. Yeah. Three nights in a row. Yeah. I and, find it, it's funny with Nicholas. It's always in all of these legends. There's another one. It's always three. The triple play. For the, for the Trinity. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he sneaks it in the, the den window, right? Mm-hmm. And I guess he gets caught. Well, the and dad, the is... dad's like, who's doing this? And he stays up and he catches Nicholas putting the money in. Right. Yeah. It's cool too, because Nicholas the is protecting night. the pride of the father. Yeah. You know, as men who are supposed to be the providers to have another man provide for your family is kind of shameful. Yeah. Whether we like it or not. Single-handedly keeping your daughter out, out of, of prostitution. prostitution. Like, yeah. So Nicholas is not only doing charity. He's allowing the father to save face. Right. Right. 
and he's not taking the credit publicly. Yeah. It says, yeah. But so he catches him the third night. It's it's a good thing that he only caught him the third night because then then he could have gotten his bag of coin. That's right. For the he's third bad. daughter, if he would have caught him before and had too much pride after two nights, yeah. then it would have. They say that that the iconography of the girls are getting like a treat uh, at bedtime, so they're in their like sleep gear, <laughs> and he can't. And then you know it's saying, "Oh, better go to sleep or." You're not going to get your dowry, dowry, dowry. money. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's. I think this is where a lot of the, the Santa stuff comes yeah, from. Yeah, this is the Santa. I mean, this is... This is it? Is no, this it? Yeah, yeah, there's no chimney in this story. He does it in the window. Right, but, but it's there, still if, like the, the concept of a gift dropping through a yes. edifice orifice. At night. Oh, <laughs> at night. At night. While everybody's asleep. The present. Yeah. You wake up in the morning, there's a present. Yeah. For Christmas, you don't have to become... A prostitute. A hooker. Yeah. Merry that's, Christmas. That's that's the the Saint Nicholas story. So he's courtesy of Santa. Yes, yeah. he's doing he's doing charity at night. And um you know, my my book Sword and Serpent, I'll keep bringing it up because we're always talking about Nicholas. He's a key guy and he's always working charity secretly. Ah, secret I'm charity. I'm gonna read secret I, charity. I want I wanna hear your take charity. on it. Hopefully yeah, you like I'm gonna it. read well, I want to read your book, I think, this summer. I, I don't get much time because I'm always reading for school, but I'm going to read your book this summer, and I'm going to, then we're going to, we should do a show where, like, it's like a guy who's read a you? book just just once. You know, whenever you right. read a book just once, you're like, oh, man, I wish I could sit down with the author. Right. I've got the author right here, yeah, so I'm going to be like, why yeah, did, we should do that. Why, why did this, why did, why did Old Yeller have to die, <laughs> Dr. Marshall? <laughs> right. Why couldn't he have just lived forever? Dogs do that, right? Yeah, I'm, that's that's the kind of question I ask we'll authors it. when I have them one on one. Yeah, we'll I'm going to read it this summer. Okay, so put a pin in it. So we have an. I like you know you brought up the three. There's always the three, and the next story is about three men who are sentenced to death, capital punishment. And Nicholas comes in, and this this is actually an early early story, and it shows him coming in with violence. He comes in and he takes the the executioner's sword away. He breaks it up. Now, some people might see see capital punishment is bad. That's the more no. These guys were falsely accused. The story says that. So he's not just against capital punishment qua right. capital punishment. He's against the innocent being killed. And so he comes right. in and he stops it. And there's three right. of them once again, just like we had three right. girls. And the, yeah, that's right. I forgot about the three three capital punishment people. I was thinking about the the three the three pickled children. Oh yeah, tell, that one. Yeah, why don't you it's tell that story? Three. Yeah, there, this that is the totally, story of the three pickled kids. Now it's it's important because the the uh, the craft of of how to pickle a child is no longer really in in business. So we don't even have a context for this. Well, they they pickled me. Was a, they, they pickled they, me. They, they back pickled then. you. Yeah, no, they yeah. did. You know, they just put it in salt oh, water. You said they pickled me. I was like, no, no, okay, no. well, meat. you're going to have to share this story. Meat. Yeah, yeah, they pickled meat. Yeah. You had to keep it in the brine. They preserve meat by pickling it. But it's just, it's funny. The story's called St. Nicholas and the Three Pickled Kids or whatnot. Right. So there are three children that I guess it was a famine. And they were desperate for food. And a guy killed some kids and pickled them to store the meat. And St. Nicholas appeared. It was a butcher. Who is doing this? I guess, you know, everything tastes like chicken, is it? Um, so so St. Nicholas shows up and takes the pickled kids and brings them back to life. Yeah, he, he, he busts them out of the barrel and then he makes the sign of the cross over the three kids and they come alive. Yeah. So they, and, and it's again with the three and I guess the butcher gets in trouble and the story has a happy ending. The kids wash the brine off. Are you still pickled? Are you forever pickled? Is it a one time? I think, I think everyone I cut, kind of smells pickle on you. Yeah. Yeah. For the rest of your the, whole life, yeah. you are pickled and you smell, you, you reek of uh, brine. Yeah. But it's better because then you're Have you alive. ever heard of the Christmas and, pickle, Tim? I it's, a, it's a tradition in our family. Um, we decorate the Christmas tree. We usually yeah. do it on Gaudete Sunday, third Sunday of Advent. That's our bring out the Christmas tree. In our oh, family, in our family, Advent begins, and then we have December sixth. That's Saint Nicholas Day, and we put our stockings up on that day. And the next morning, the kids get like shoes or pajamas or maybe a little toy, 
and a note, oh, nice. a note from St. Nicholas. Cool. And then our next big deal is Gaudete, where we put the tree up, and then, of course, Christmas. But when the tree goes up, all the ornaments are put up, and then we have a glass pickle. I don't know. We got a glass pickle. And you hide the glass <laughs> pickle. It's like a, a blown glass. You know what I'm talking about? Like, if you, yeah. if you dropped it on the ground, it would shatter. Those yeah. kind of ornaments, the breakable yeah. kind. It's a pickle. I think this is a Bavarian German custom. And you hide it deep in the tree. And the first child who spots it gets a present right then. That's dope. Yeah. This is on December 6th? No, we, we do it when we put the tree up. Or maybe it's on Christmas. I oh, can't remember. Yeah, that's a, yeah that, that's, uh, that's cool. Yeah. Is that so, because of the pickle well, children? I don't know. Did I you never, know about the pickle children? I always thought it was kind of a weird deal. We got a pickle ornament and you got to find it. But I wonder if it's, it goes back to St. Nicholas in the idea of pickling. Well, who started that tradition? Does it I come from you or your family or, your, or, or Joy's? I don't know. We just got a pickle. You just, I just, just remember we've always moved you? There's just, no, there's just always been a pickle. There just always was a pickle. You don't even remember where you got the ornament? Maybe, maybe our family is the only family in the world that does this. Anybody else out there, cool. if you've ever heard of this, the pickle. It's one of our traditions. But, if not, I, you, I highly re- recommend it. It's a great, great fun game. But I mean, just for the sake of the narrative, like you just woke up one Christmas morning and there was a pickle and you automatically knew what to do with it? No, I, or what? I, I just, re- I can remember like as a kid, teenager, the pickle, I'm kind of wondering if it comes from maybe my stepmother somehow, but I don't, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I just randomly said I probably shouldn't even brought it up. But that's a good story. I, I mean, I, yeah, a pickle ornament that is hidden, a blown glass pickle ornament. All right, just googled it. And you can, there's all these sites selling the pickle ornament. Really? Yes, I just googled it. So I'm not. There's a Wikipedia page called the Christmas Pickle. So I'm not crazy here, Tim. This is the thing. No, I, I don't think you're crazy. I just think I think it's funny that so this was an inherited all right, passed so here down. It is. Ornament? In the tradition, an ornamental pickle is placed on a Christmas tree as one of the decorations. On Christmas morning, the first child to find the pickle on the tree would receive an extra present from Santa. Okay. Yeah, that, that sounds awesome. So this is the thing, man. But did you do this as a kid? That's all I'm trying to figure out. I wasn't doubting. I was just wondering. I can't remember as a little kid, heard but I this. remember being in my parents' house and there was the pickle thing. And I never, oh, okay. I never was reflective enough to be like, why are we looking for a pickle on the tree? All I knew is I want to get that present. Of course. No, if, I mean, I, I like- if I find the pickle, I get the present. Look, what's good about the pickle tradition is that it's not less commercialism, which is the, the, tre- the, mindy, uh, the, the mindless sort of trendy thing. Um, everyone's prejudice nowadays goes toward, oh, commercialism and Christmas is bad. I was actually tweeting this back and forth with Steve Skojek of, of one Peter five. Sorry, sorry, Steve. I don't know how to say your name. And we were both like commercialism is good. Hey, look, it's a crude way of celebrating Jesus more, but it's a way nonetheless. And I like the idea. I like the concept of the Christmas pickle here. Because it means a kid has an opportunity to get extra presents. That's right. Let. I don't like this concept of, oh, we only buy our kid. We give to our kids' favorite nonprofit or whatever. It's like kids don't like nonprofits. <laughs> get them, get them presents. Quit cheaping out. Right. Like get your kids' presents, and then develop slowly year by year, the inculturate, inculcate the concept that this is happening because of Jesus. And by the time they're adults, they'll still like presents because yes. they're they're flesh and blood. I like ple- presents. But this goes to your St. Nicholas thing, because I know you wanted yeah. to come around to this. I think it's very important. Yeah, I, I think we had a major Christmas commercial pickle, is good. pickle tangent here. And <laughs> while you're talking, I'm just looking at I'm I'm interested. And the Wikipedia page says that it happened in the American Civil War. Ooh. Private John Lower was uh, captured and put into a prison camp. He was starving on Christmas Eve. He begged for some food, and a guard gave him a pickle to eat. <laughs> Probably, the poor bastard probably wanted some meat, and yeah. the guy's like, "Here, eat this, eat this pickle, <laughs> eat this brined pickle, eat this brined." Pi- yeah, I mean, no, but you were a misunderstanding. What I was trying to ask you, I like, I believe that I like the pickle story. I like the concept of a Christmas contest. Yeah, whoever finds a pickle gets more presents. I was just not understanding in your family history. You as the as the paterfamilias, or you as the little 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 boy version of Doctor Marshall. Yeah. Uh, 
where did it come from? Like, where did you get it? Or did it just show up in your house magically? I no, think Santa know. just put it on there. I don't know. This is legendary. Yeah. Okay. I, I like it. I I, I could I could I could try the Christmas pickle. I think I think you guys need extra. to get. A, I think everybody out there. So I have a challenge for everybody to attend okay. Latin Mass during Advent. That's one challenge. The other challenge is I want you to get a, a, a Christmas pickle. This is deep. I like it. Christmas pickle, and then like you can it. tell the story of Santa and the three pickled kids. It's a it's right. a perfect time for the Potter families to sit down on Christmas Eve. And tell them, hey, these three kids, they got killed by a butcher. <laughs> they got pickled. Santa came and rescued them. You'd like to hear a Christmas story, right? <laughs> right. How about one about a bunch of kids getting <laughs> yeah. butchered and then pickled? Yeah, youngsters. Yeah. A serial killer butcher. <laughs> so, let's, so let's talk yeah. about fantasy stories, myths, storytelling, and Santa before we wrap up here. So there are some literalists who don't like what we have to say about Halloween games. We did a whole episode on Halloween. Joy and I did an episode on Halloween. We've talked about fantasy fiction, Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, all this kind of stuff. And people, most people are like, yes, rock on, we love it. There's people out there like, no. If you tell your kid that Santa comes to houses and brings gifts, you are lying to children. That's a sin. You're breaking the seventh commandment. I'm sorry, Eighth Commandment. Thou shalt mm-hmm. bear false witness. What do we say to those people? Well, I mean, you're lying by omission anytime you try to keep uh, it up on this standard, of course, this absurd standard. You're lying anytime you try to keep, you know, your your young kid from learning about sex too young, right? That would be a lie of yeah, omission. Yeah, that's different, if, though. If, that's different. Well, no, no. If you're being an because lying be this is if you're well, lying has the implication of deceit, and by not telling kids about sex, you're not deceiving them. Unless you tell them, they say that story. This is on the LB tip on the LB standard. If I'm not endorsing the LB standard, I'm saying I just want to be Thomas. You're going to die on that sword. Okay. Right. Well, so oh, I mean, we don't have to go all into it, but. A lie to a uh, when someone has not attained their majority yet, right? You, the the standards owed uh, the honesty standards are are different, right? Well, like literally, we are enabling a yeah, kid to think, unveil the world. In I, um, I don't want to go the route and say, well, as long as they're a minor, you can deceive them. I, that's not my argument. My argument is, kids in order to have fun. Part of fun is playing games, and playing games is not deceptive. Like back yeah. to the back to what we did last time. Like, hey, cops and robbers, I'm going to shoot you. You know, better get over. I got you. You get in jail. There is no jail. There is no gun. I'm not a cop. They're not a robber. Everything is not true that we're doing. But that doesn't mean it's deceptive, or that there's a of lie course. in place, right? Because they're of kids. course they're kids. Of course, that's right. But except. It's not that I, I don't I don't even use the language of deception. It's not even in a in a in a philosophic sense. It's not even deceiving when someone hasn't attained their majority. You're not talking. To, she, what do you call, not to get what, into equivocity? What do you count majority? Univocity. What do you count majority? I always think of that as like eighteen. Well, not that old, but yeah. Let's yeah, say sure. age of reason. It, age of reason. Yeah, age of reason. When someone's still six, seven, eight, whether we're talking about. Or three. What what an LB would consider a lie of omission, not telling the kids that there's horrible things in the world or sexual things, or a lot what they would call a lie of commission, like you know, Santa literally left these gifts on. I hope no one's letting the kids watch this. The LBs would be happy if we accidentally uh, inadvertently spoiled Santa Claus. They'd be like, Yeah, kill him, ruined that kid's Christmas. But I, I don't I don't want to do that. I was having this talk the other night with Another uh, a, a theology teacher who's a friend of mine, he was asking, okay, why are you pro Santa? And I was unpacking, unfurling the entire line of argumentation. Mm. And I was, um, I realized there was a kid sitting like four feet away. And I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to kill myself if I ruin this kid's Santa Claus. The kid was like five. Oh my so, gosh. And he was looking right at me. Yeah, no. So I, I stopped. I actually had to stop my buddy. I was like, no, no, no. We'll talk about it later. But it is a big deal. That's a very big deal. Right. But the point is, it's not deceit. That that was what I was saying. I That's wasn't right. saying it's okay deceit. It's 
it's until someone it, you're not actually even capable of talking univocally as if this would be real deceit. We talk to kids because they can't grasp certain concepts. Mm-hmm. Um, we can't, you talk to kids with entirely different language and even language that if you were talking to someone else might constitute deceit. If I were telling you, because look, look, here's the proof of what I'm saying. If we're speaking analogically and we're like, well, this is how you really understand Christmas better or real, really this is how you understand St. Nicholas better. He, he, did, he did these important things for kids so they didn't have to become hookers or whatever. Right. Like that's not, a kid doesn't know what right. any of those things are. So instead we give them presents, that's analogical language. But if I said that to you, if you're like, dude, so um, um, what, do you really leave presents for your kids or does Santa actually do that? You're speaking like off the record. You're right. like, hey, head of household to head of household. Like, what if do you I do? Told so we're you, speaking in literal If terms. I told you, bro, I stayed up. St. Nicholas of Myra came to my house and left yeah. presents for my kids. Did he leave them for your kids? Yeah. You're like, no, didn't happen to me. I would be yeah. lying to you. That would be wrong. Yeah. But when it, it's a kid, that's exactly right. Like, for example, uh, my daughter the other day, she hands me a baby doll. She's like, I'm the mommy, you're the daddy. Let's have lunch. I have a picnic. And she had like a box of like some fake food in it and like a bag of chips that she like stole from the pantry. And she set up a picnic and we played the game. And, you know, I didn't say, hey, you're not really a mommy because right. you're three years old and I'm not married to you because I'm your dad. And this baby's plastic and this food is plastic. That would like ruin the fun. Right. She's just like loving. We're, we're having fun. This is great. I think I'm doing a virtuous thing by pretending to be the daddy of a plastic doll. You are. And I'm not and lying do- and I'm not deceiving. I'm doing a good thing. We were telling stories the other night and she was like, I, I, she wanted to talk about Jesus. So I talked about how he died on the cross and he rose again. And she's like, yeah, they put him in a rock. I was like, yeah, they put him in a rock. And he's like, he got out. It's like, he came back alive. And then she said, and then a mermaid sat on that rock. <laughs> Because she probably Bible, right? she probably saw like an angel, you know, sitting on the rock and thought it was a mermaid. And I was kind of like, all right. You know, I didn't tell her she was wrong. But <laughs> sure. she was so Because she wanted to tell me about it, too. You know, like I was telling right. her. And she, and she was like, oh, and then there's the mermaid. You know, and I didn't like bust her bubble. And like, you know, that's th- there'll be a time when I explain I was actually an angel, not a mermaid. But, you know, she's a little girl and she likes her little world. She's you know? a little girl and her concepts aren't aren't even fully formable yet. Either the the uh, exactly. the ratio doesn't uh, adequate the 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 intellectus doesn't adequate the ratio yes. in the same way for a little kid. You get, see, we're only having to use these nerd terms because of the LBs out there. I know. That are like, did I know. he lie to his kid about the mermaid? And is he a heretic? Yeah. Should we even listen to this area? But I mean, for no, a three year old, is... the the preternatural existence of an angel. And that of a mermaid are pretty close in a three-year-old mind. Um, yeah. You know? Yeah. And I will correct her, but I just kind of like had a little chuckle about it. I can't wait to tell my wife about that one. Or she, I it told her funny. about St. Nicholas bringing presents to girls, left out the prostitute part for, obviously. Sure. And Liar. then at the very end, she says to me, yeah, and then Gollum came to get me, Gollum from Lord <laughs> of the Rings. But Santa, this last thing. Just, but Santa came and he saved the day. He saved me. I was like, cool story, you know? Cool. Like he saves people from right, Gollum. He yeah. saves them from prostitution. Right, yeah. I mean, saves them from... So she was like, t- she wants to tell me a story, and so she's now the girl who gets saved by Santa Claus. Yeah. I like that. Saints me too. are in our lives. Saints pray for us. Saints get involved. And, you know, she's making some applications. And is it 100% correct? No. Is it the general morality and trajectory of who St. Nicholas is as a savior of little girls? Yes. I'm yeah, going to so roll ana- with that. I'm going to roll with that. Analogically, it is correct. Let's, let's use Tolkien's language here about like Father Christmas. He is very explicit about this. Analogically, you are getting the concept. Um, yeah, I can't tell it, her Santa Claus saved her from prostitution in the whorehouse. She doesn't right. understand that evil. She does understand the evil of Gollum coming to get people. Right. Of so, course. Yeah. But, it, but like you said, and, and this would be like my mom never to this day, never admitted to me or my brothers that Santa's not real. A little bit of a uh, gourd show. So if you bring up like Santa Claus with my mom, I haven't brought it up in a long time, but it, it, it would come up like even when I had kids and I was like, well, we'd always just joke. She's like, Santa's real. She would say it like, I'm like, mom, I'm like, I'm like a father of my own household over here. 
you realize I would make this joke not knowing that we would someday I would be sitting here with Dr. Taylor Marshall doing this show. I was like, you realize if I took you at your word and I was the head of a household and I was just like, the kids got giddy about Santa Claus and I was like, this is going to be good kids. And then I just waited upstairs in their room with them and we all in our fuzzy pajamas ran down the next morning. It would like ruin their Christmas, right? Right. Because when adults engage other adults, um, who are capable, they have intellect uses that are capable of adequating that ratio. And you talk on this level with one another and you don't admit what myth for what it is. Then that's when real, real misinformation and disinformation happens. Yes, that's right. But, it's like, it's like in Chris's vacation where Chevy Chase says Santa Slay was spotted. And then cousin A is like, you serious? Clark? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We no, me and my brother say that to each other. Anytime you say something uh, unbelievable, go serious, Clark. You serious, Clark? Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's exactly like that. Yes, that, and the airline pilot spotted Santa's sleigh. You serious, yeah. Clark? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what's <laughs> happened. The, the reason that joke is funny. You see, the LDs right. don't get this. They'll, they won't yeah. get it after we explain it here in even Aristotelian term. They don't care. They want to. They they don't want to be separated from the the, right. the bad ideas. But yes. this is why we like Halloween. This is how. Yes, you introduce in a super inchoate, nascent, I guess, rudimentary way the concept of All Saints Day. Well, candy has nothing to do with saints. Not at the beginning. It's a spectrum, exactly. and then you move them up. And, and you know what? God Same loves the spectrum. Christmas. He God, does. God could have had babies come out of the womb fully rational, like Spock. Yeah, exactly. But instead, he exactly. put a seven to ten year delay on their development of their intellect. And right. then he has the logos come to earth and say, become like them to be saved. Right. And e even then, even if you have an LB trying to, to, to get hit, okay, well, I'll take it this way. They always want black letter laws. They always want their prudence right. and their common sense not to have to be functioning. It'll be uh, Marshall just said seven to 10 years. So you're telling me 10 years is the, the absolute dead date on this. So you can't let your kids believe after 10. It's like, no, it's a spectrum. That's yeah. the whole point. You got to go through like, not everything's black letter law. Some things are, most things aren't. Nature abhors distinctions of kind. Most distinctions in nature are distinctions of degree. So you got to get hip with this. You can do yeah. what, you can have fun with it. One, that's okay. You don't have to be boring. Don't have to be a nerd about everything. And two, you don't have to, you shouldn't be a literalist with everything, meaning we don't have black letter law. You got to use your prudence and your common sense. And that, yeah. that's. And as the kids know, get that's, older that's, and your nine year old says, does Santa Claus live in heaven or is he at the North Pole? You say, oh, he's in heaven. You know, like when they're nine years old, like I, maybe your mom didn't, but you know, you love, you level with the kids because they're at the age of reason. They figured this, you know, I often say, well, what's the age of reason? How do we know? I was like, pretty much when they figure out Santa Claus, they attain the age of reason. Like when they take all the, the, the mystical elements and they realize, yeah, it doesn't all line up with what I know. They've, they've come to the age of reason. But I, yeah. And then, and again, that's a tough question. Well, we, we should, we should, we should end on that. I don't, my, one of my mine is seven now and she's starting to prod, but I, I, I want to keep it going for, for as long as I can. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like starting to prod, but still with a lot of natural beliefs so we, would, like, both, yeah, no, we would both recognize that you failed as a parent if your daughter is 17 and she's like all about it you're sure like yeah, yeah. failed you know like, yeah. yeah she's like i got my license last <laughs> year now i can drive go get a bite to eat on christmas eve as i wait for santa to come right. down the chimney right. and you know if she can understand the the human anatomy and biology because she studied that in mm -hmm. school and why he would probably break a bone if he slid down a chimney as an obese man, <laughs> then, you know, it's probably time to tell him. I'm just getting paranoid. My kids are actually up. So yeah. we should, yeah. We'll close there. We, the one with the kids, yeah. Got to preserve the kids. So <laughs> happy St. Nicholas Day. I think this video comes out either the day before or the day of Nicholas Day. So happy St. Nicholas Day. Have some fun with it. You don't have, have to pickle. be pickle. Get to pickle. Do the pickle. <laughs> Don't pickle your kids, but do preserve your kids and their innocence. Till next time. From pickling. Oh, make yeah. sure you click the like button, subscribe, hit the bell, have fun on St. Nicholas. Do something special on St. Nicholas Day. Read some of these That's stories. Crazy. Talk about these stories. Show them the icon. Yeah. Tell them about Aries, yeah. et cetera. So God bless everyone. Pray the Slap rosary. Slap a heretic. Slap a heretic. H-slap. Signing off. <laughs>